Okay, uh, let's start now. Okay, uh, so I'm really excited to welcome Russ to the EI seminar this week. Uh, Russ has done a lot of great work in both machine learning as well as embodied intelligence and is currently the UPMC Professor of Computer Science in the Department of Machine Learning at CMU. Russ received his PhD in Computer Science from the University of Toronto, and then he spent two postdoc years here at MIT before joining the University of Toronto and then later moving to CMU. Russ's primary interests lie in deep learning, machine learning, and large-scale optimization. He is currently the action editor for the Journal of Machine Learning Research, uh, served on the senior program committee of several top-tier learning conferences, including NeurIPS and ICML, and was a program co-chair for ICML 2019. He is an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow, a Microsoft Research Faculty Fellow, and a, C a Canada Research Chair in Statistical Machine Learning, as well as a recipient of the Early Researcher Award, uh, Google Faculty Award, and the NVIDIA Pioneers of AI Award. For everyone in person, we will host a social event on the third floor after the seminar. Thank you, and <clears throat> thanks for the, um, for the invitation. It's very exciting to be here and uh, talk about some of the work that's happening in, in, in my lab. And in particular, I'm gonna be talking about, you know, a few works, a few papers. And a lot of this work was actually done by my former student, Devendra Chaplot, as well as, you know, a few collaborators um, um, uh, in my lab as well. Okay, so <clears throat> when we think about, you know, uh, embodied AI, and on, in general, when we think about reinforcement learning, we typically think about learning behaviors, right? How do we map observations to actions um, to achieve a particular goal? If we think about physical intelligence, you know, let's say you have an agent, the agent um, uh, observes the environment um, and takes an action. And obviously agents, they need to be moving around the world physically. Um, the actions that you're taking right now will affect your future observations. And of course, you need some form of a spatial or, or semantic understanding of the world for the agent to move around the environment. Now, um, let's, uh, for this particular talk, I'll focus on a specific task of navigation. So let's say I give you a particular goal I need to get to. And if you get to that goal, you get a reward. If you don't, you get a negative reward. And when we think about a lot of existing systems today, in particular in the space of deep reinforcement learning, given an observation, you know, uh, uh, you pass it through the deep neural network, the deep neural network gives you actions, and um, ultimately you get some form of reward, whether the section was a good action or not. And sometimes you get sparse rewards. And you can get those rewards and essentially update parameters of your neural network. And then in a nutshell, this can be viewed as what's sometimes called end-to-end -end reinforcement learning system. Um, now, in this talk, we will also focus a lot on goal-conditioned navigation. So in this setting, I'm going to give you um, a goal, let's say, you know, particular observation uh, with particular location I need to get to. And you can think about, again, the entire system. It's just that the goal is uh, becomes well, part of the um, Now, in terms of the goal, uh, it could be a point goal. Say I give you x, y coordinate. It could be an image goal, which is very popular in computer vision domains. Um, you know, uh, an image goal could be a TV or, or any particular image that you need to find. It could be an object goal. I'll just tell you what I need to find. Or it could be a language goal. And um, towards the end of the talk, I'm gonna show you some examples of actually you know, uh, uh, executing instructions or following instructions. But language goals are useful because they are convenient for us to communicate to our agents. And you can also use uh, a notion of compositionality, sort of uh, uh, things that you can do in, in, uh, uh, with language. It's uh, you know, when you're compositionally constructing, let's say um, uh, representations of instructions or in general, when you're learning uh, uh, language instructions. Now, here's just to give you a preview. Here's one of the system that we've built um, at CMU. So this is actually in the apartment of um, a real apartment of my student. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the agent. It's a little locker bot that moves around. It builds the semantic map of the world. So here you're seeing on uh, over here, and it's trying to find a particular goal, which is the potted plant. Right, so it moves around, it builds um, uh, a map of where the free space is, it tries to understand something about the objects, where they are located. And as it moves around, it actually finds the goal. And 
you know, the entire system actually sits on this low local, uh, local robot. So you're essentially doing processing, you're doing um, local slam and um, uh, finding, finding the goal. So <clears throat> when we think about these types of systems, actually, if we want to deploy them in the real world, one of the key challenges is um, the notion of exploration, right? So you need to explore the environment to find the goal. And this is a long-standing problem in, in, uh, in, in uh, reinforcement learning and general machine learning in general. Um, and so, you know, how do you build an agent that efficiently in a completely new environment, let's say it's a new house that, that you have, moves around and uh, explores, uh, explores the environment instead of, you know, just staying in one particular room or, or not having the ability to explore the environment. Um, and now, you know, how do we explore the, uh, the unseen environment? And if we think about end-to-end -end reinforcement learning systems, you know, end-to-end -end reinforcement learning systems, they have to learn about mapping. They have to do some pose estimation internally. Um, you know, they have to do some form of path planning. And in general, a lot of these systems are inefficient when, you, when we talk about sample inefficiency. And in general, they actually have poor generalization capabilities. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that. So when we talk about you know, black box RL systems, um, instead, what we're gonna to try to do here is we're gonna incorporate strength of learning. Uh, so we're gonna be using machine learning approaches, but we're also gonna be building modular and hierarchical system. And again, for many of you who worked in the space of ML, have been in that space for a long time, it comes as no surprise that building systems that are modular and hierarchical uh, should bring benefits if you build them correctly. And this is where, you know, to some extent, the prior knowledge comes in or your inductive bias comes in when you're building these systems. Um, so let me show you one particular system. It's, you know, there is a fair amount of engineering that went into the system. That's why I like it, um, is what we call active neural slam. So we can think of the system as the following. Let's say you have an observation. So here we're only working with RGB. We can also work with, uh, with depth as well. Uh, but here we're only focusing on RGB and you have some notion of sensor pose. So think of the sensor pose as just X, Y, uh, and uh, coordinate and orientation. Um, that module goes through what we call the neural slam, which is the system that we can learn in a completely supervised setting based off, on uh, off policy data. Uh, but what the neural slam gives you, it gives you a notion of uh, an estimate of the map. And it gives you uh, an estimate uh, of your poses. So it tells you where you are approximately, and it gives you a partial construction of the map. And the map can, in our case, it basically specifies uh, where the free space is, where the walls are, where the obstructions are. Um, now, based on this, uh, uh, we have what we call a global policy. And the global policy generates what we call a long-term goal. So you can think of this as a long-term goal as a goal where you need to go for exploration, right? So here's a blue dot. Um, it's a small reinforcement learning policy that basically is telling me go over there. Uh, based on that, you have a planner. The planner plans a path how to get to that goal based on the partially observed environment, partially observed map. Um, and uh, after that, we generate what we call a short-term goal. <clears throat> and in our case, a short-term goal is basically uh, trying to move uh, uh, or, or, you know, for the next, uh, I think in our case, it was the next meter, uh, 60 centimeters that we're moving. Um, and the short-term goal essentially goes into the local policy and the local policy produces the actual actions. And in our case, our actual actions are you know, move forward 30 centimeters, turn 30 degrees to the right, turn 30 degrees to the right, to, to, to the left. So the action space is fairly simple. It's a little locker bot. Um, and so if you look at all of these different pieces, um, you know, compared to the black box RL algorithm, that would basically say, take this image and maybe the pose and just uh, uh, output actions. And if you look at the entire system, a lot of these little modules, you know, they do come from us from robotics community. Um, right? With the exception that these blue boxes is something that we're learning. Um, based on the data. Uh, one thing I also wanted to mention is that for our planner, we're using a plain A star planner, just trying to map, uh, figure out the best plan. 
uh, there's been a few methods actually, you know, trying to develop differentiable planets. But so far, as far as I know, none of the existing sort of uh, um, neural kind of planet uh, models actually uh, work uh, very well. And so this is one area of research that I think we're missing right now. Uh, now, let me tell you a little bit about, um, and so the global policy is something that we can learn at the training time. The local policy is also something that we can learn at the training time. In fact, the local policy can be just a simple deterministic policy that just tries to execute according to this plan. So the neural slam is probably one of the key components in this system where we try to go from images and poses into some representation of the semantic map. So let me quickly tell you what, uh, what that system does and how it works. Uh, let's say you have um, uh, observation at time t minus one, observation at time t. Um, that goes through the mapper, and the mapper is essentially a convolutional neural network that estimates, you know, the walls and the free space, right? So you can sort of like see there's a little corner here, and you're estimating what that is. Uh, if you have depth um, uh, model, you can also incorporate that. Um, based on that, we also know what the relative pose is between the two frames. Um, then we essentially do spatial transformation and, you know, uh, map it to, um, um, you know, try to map these two frames uh, together. Um, that goes into the pose estimator. Uh, the pose estimator is essentially trying to identify what our pose is given these two observations. Um, and uh, gives us the pause estimate. And again, through the spatial transformation, we can actually put the egocentric projection into geocent geocentric projection, right? So geocentric projection is essentially projecting what we're seeing to the global map. And now we have a map at the previous time step. We essentially doing channel pool and aggregating information from the previous time step. This is our map estimate from the previous time step to the next time step. Now, these kind of mapping modules can be learned in a per supervised setting, right? At the training time, let's say if, if we have a good depth uh, model, we can actually create uh, labeled uh, uh, examples. For pose estimation, it's the same way. So that actually leverages and gives us uh, a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, it gives us sort of uh, a way of tuning these systems and, and fine tuning these systems, right? we're not necessarily relying on reinforcement learning to actually build, uh, uh, build those mappers. Um, so that's important for actually getting the system to, uh, to work. And I'm sure there's been a lot of work trying to improve these pieces, right? How do you map and, and what that should be? Uh, but with enough data, uh, you can actually build a reasonable uh, uh, mapping modules and, and reasonable pose estimation modules, okay? Now, um, and this is what we call a neural slam, uh, just because we're essentially um, uh, figuring out what these, uh, what these components are. So, you know, and this is the system just to show you, this is uh, a system that operates on, you know, was trained in Gibson environment, but we're just translating it into another, what's called metaphor 3D environment. It's just uh, almost like a virtual simulator seeing on, on uh, you're seeing it over here and so the agent moves around the environment and you can kind of like see it's exploring so these are long-term goals that we are you know specifying where that it should be and the agent is just trying to explore the environment as much as possible to reach these long-term goals um one thing interesting thing about this setting is that you know if you train it in uh, uh, one of the environments called, called Gibson environment, it's a little bit easier to compare to meta, Metaport 3D environment, just the houses are smaller. Um, what's interesting here is that if you look at the reinforcement learning algorithms, you can think of them as black box reinforcement learning algorithms, they're actually doing reasonably well, right? You know, in terms of the coverage uh, for, you know, fixed number of time steps compared to active neural slam, they're not doing you know, too badly. And there's been a few, a number of papers that, you know, trying to estimate the depth in different ways or trying to build the black box systems, right? And if we look at uh, Metaphor 3D, then, you know, in terms of exploration, you know, percent coverage, how much we can explore, again, we're doing better, uh, but the reinforcement learning algorithm is actually not doing badly, uh, right? So that was interesting for us because in this case, black box is much easier to train and, uh, you know, they've done reasonably well. 
Um, but now let me look at one specific task, which is the point goal navigation task, right? That's a common task. I think there was a CDPR challenge a couple of years ago in this active neural slam uh, model. We won uh, um, uh, one of the competitions, uh, but in point goal navigation, the goal for you is to get to a specific, um, uh, try to get to a specific, uh, you know, to a specific goal. So you can think of the entire system when we have this long-term goal, we can just specify what this long-term goal should be. Right? And the goal is to get there as fast as possible in a new environment. So you know, when we think about the objective, we wanna to navigate to the goal. And the metric that's commonly used is called um, uh, SPL metric. So it's success weighted by inverse path length. Um, and just to quickly tell you what this is, um, you know, it's the average sum. Success here is a zero one. So if you've reached your goal, you, know, you get one. If you did reach your goal, you get zero. So if you fail to reach your goal, you essentially get zero. And this is also the ratio of the shortest path length to the path length that your agent took, right? So the shortest path length is basically telling you what's the optimal, what is the optimal trajectory, avoiding all, this, all the obstacles to get to the point. Uh, divided by the length that your agent took to get there, right? So if your agent basically wanders around randomly and accidentally hits the goal, you know, then you know, this ratio is gonna be close to zero. So the goal here is to try to get to your target as fast as possible and using kind of the optimal path, uh, you know, if it's possible. So the global policy here always gives the point goal as, as your long-term goal. And so one of the things that you can look at is you can try to look at harder examples. So for example, you can look at what we call the hard distance setting where you're basically saying, you know, that you have a high geodesic distance. So to get to your goal, you actually have to travel for a long periods of time. Um, and this is uh, what we call harder GEDR. It's the higher ratio of geodesic to Euclidean distance. So it's one of those things that, you know, if your goal is not very far from you, but to get to that goal, you have to move around a lot. So for example, it typically happens in the examples where I'm staying in one room and to get to my goal, my goal is just across the room, you know, the other side of the wall. And, you know, Euclidean distance is very short, but geodesic distance, I actually have to get out of my room and then go through a bunch of other rooms to essentially optimally get to the point where I need to go. Um, right, so we think of these as, as sort of hard settings. And so these are some examples where, you know, um, you would basically say that, you know, you're trying to reach your goal, but you actually have to travel for some number of time steps. And you can sort of see that the agent builds the semantic map of the environment as it moves around. And that actually helps us quite a bit in terms of figuring out um, uh, where we need to go and whether we've been in certain places. Uh, now, in this case, I just want to clarify, we're not actually building, you know, the true semantic map. We're just building the map of where the obstacles are and where the free space is, uh, right? But one thing that I wanted to point out here is that if you look at, you know, existing methods, again, on the Gibson environment, um, you can sort of see that the reinforcement learning algorithms, they actually do okay. They're not doing well, but not terrible. Um, these are what's called imitation learning methods. So here you essentially have the, the trajectory that you can get at some, you know, the training time from, from humans. Um, and you're basically converting this problem into supervised learning problem, just predicting what the optimal action should be given my observed uh, uh, input. And this is what the active neural slam modules are doing. But what's, uh, and so this is reinforcement learning, this is imitation learning, and this is our approach. Um, but what's interesting is that if you start looking at the harder examples, um, you can sort of see that the enforcement learning methods, you know, are working much worse. In fact, if you look at the, what we call hard distance, so travel time from the location where you are to where you're trying to go is, you know, fairly large. I think in our case, it was in the order of probably 25 or 30 meters. Um, you can see that a lot of existing reinforcement learning algorithms basically fail, um, right? And of course, our method is not perfect either, um, but it's far, far better than just black box RL. And here you can also see imitation learning uh, methods are also suffering quite a bit. 
Uh, but this sort of, you know, uh, was interesting for us to, to make this observation, which is essentially saying that, you know, um, uh, a lot of times just the black box, the enforcement learning algorithms, they can suffer from, you know, solving these tasks where you need to solve something that has, you know, essentially has a long planning horizon, right? Because what happens a lot with these reinforcement learning algorithms in practice is that they sort of, they go in the right direction, but then essentially they'll, they get stuck or they come back to the places that they've been, you know, they, they visited before and so forth. So a lot of times they would, um, they would fail, right? And this is kind of like the metaphor environment as well. Now, one of the things um, that, um, you know, um, we've looked at the point goal, but the other thing is, you know, we can look at is we can look at the image goal, right? So I tell you, I give you a specific image and I tell you how to get, you know, find me uh, a way to get to that image. And this is where, you know, we have to start modeling some notion of semantic prize or some notion of common sense. Um, so just to show you, you know, have a little bit of motivation is that let's say you have an agent. And this is the target image. This is the image that I need to find in this environment. Um, the question for you is, do I choose path number one, path number two, or path number three? Um, right? And, you know, any sort of, uh, um, any one of you would probably say, well, maybe path number one, because I don't know what's behind me. So I'll turn around and look. Or maybe path number two. It looks like it might actually lead to the kitchen. Um, but very few of us would choose path number three, uh, right? And the reason why you would basically not choose path number three is you basically say, well, I'm looking for the stove. Stove, stoves are typically located on the first floor. Uh, sorry, stoves are typically located in the kitchens and kitchens you typically see on the first floor, right? And so you would, you would not even go up the stairs. Um, you know, it's uh, like... Uh, uh, somebody had this joke where, you know, it's like, you know, your friend shows up in your um, apartment and asks, you know, can, you know, whether, you know, your friend can grab a glass of water and you say, yes, of course, go grab a glass of water. And your friend basically goes upstairs and starts looking for a glass of water in your bedroom and, you know, and you'd be like, what are you doing? Um, uh, right. And so uh, we as humans, we use semantic price and we have some form of common sense, you know, when we solve these tasks and a lot of navigation algorithms actually struggle to do so. Because for an agent, as we've seen right now, for us, you know, three paths are equally probable uh, because we don't know what's, what's there. Now, you know, this is the problem that we haven't solved and there's a lot of work done in that space. I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, problem to, to solve. But we've been looking at, you know, looking at alternative ways of constructing these uh, models based on what we call topological maps. Um, and the idea here is that ultimately, what is it that you want to do? Well, ultimately, you want to build some form of a topological map. You want to say, well, this is now living room, this is dining room, this is a hallway, this is the office, uh, right? And that tells me something about, you know, where I need to explore. So the way that we've been constructing these systems is to say, well, let's say you have a 360 degree view, panoramic view of the environment. You have the agent's um, location. Think of it as the current node in the environment. And we can think of this as nodes as representing areas. Um, and we can also think as you know, regular nodes would represent explored areas. So this is the area that I've been or I've explored. And ghost nodes, so these nodes over here, would represent unexplored areas, right? And so one interesting byproduct of learning kind of this type of representation is that the model is actually um, uh, learning that if you look at these hallways, right, or the doors, those are typically good ways of representing unexplored areas. So there is some, a little bit of notion of semantic understanding that the model learns that essentially says that walking through the whole, you know, there's a hallway, this is the door, this is another door here, is a good way of exploring environment, um, right? And it's kind of learning it from, from the training data. And let's say this is your goal image that you're trying to get to. 
Um, and um, let's say you're selecting the node based on the goal image. You're saying, you know what, this is where I need to go, perhaps to find this specific image. It's a little bit hard to see what the goal image is because these are reconstructed from, uh, uh, from uh, um, stitched images. Uh, but this is actually represents a bathroom. And so now let's say the agent chooses a particular node, it gets to that node. Uh, and then again, based on this new kind of, you know, uh, node, it, it, it again figures out where it needs to go. So again, as I mentioned before, hallways and doors are good ways of representing where it should go. And again, it's learning it on its own. And, um, and then it goes and, and goes to one of these nodes. And the, Difference between these two nodes would represent relative position. And edges would represent spatial relationships between the nodes, right? And so the idea here is that you have the node, you create ghost nodes, you expand into one of those nodes, you get to that node and so forth. So you're kind of representing everything in this, in this topological space. One thing that we're using here is what we call semantic prediction. And the idea of the semantic prediction is that, let's say if this is the image that I'm observing, the one in the middle, and my goal image you know, to go to the living room or my goal image to go to another room, um, then based on that, we're training the semantic uh, 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 score predictor that essentially tries to predict which one of these areas we should be going into. Should I be going through these doors? Should I be going through these doors? Or should I, should I be going through these doors? Um, right, and so it's essentially we partition the image into you know blocks, and we're just predicting which block we should be attending to at the training time. And this is where the model essentially learns that going through hallways, so going through doors, is a very good way of figuring out where you should be going. Um, and also conditional on the goal image, we can say, well, given this image, we should be going here. Given this image we actually should be going through this door, right? And so when we think about this neural topological uh, 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 SLAM uh, type of a system, we essentially have a graph update. We're updating the topological map as we get an observation. And the rest of the pipeline is very much the same as what I've shown you before. We have a global policy that's telling us where we need to go. And then um, um, uh, we have a local, local policy that actually you know, executes uh, low level actions. And this is compared to you know, the system that I've shown you before, which uses the neural slant. So it's really is, do we represent the structure of the world as, in, in, uh, as a graph or do we work in uh, metric space, right? And these are two sort of different approaches. We've been playing with both. We see advantages in both and disadvantages in, in, in both. So it's not a clear win one versus another, but it's an interesting type of representation because what actually helps us in this graph-based representation is that we found that we're less sensitive to inaccuracies in pose estimation uh, when we're using graph-based approach, um, right? And that's, that's what we're doing here. So visually, what this looks like is the following. Say so we have some notion of the local map versus the representation of the global map, right? So we create the ghost nodes uh, right, the model basically figures out what it part, you know, what the partitioning is. Um, it figures out, given the goal image, this has the most uh, predict uh, the, the semantic the, the, the prediction for the semantic score. So it says this is where we need to go. This is the most likelihood of you know getting to our goal image, um, right? And then the agent gets there. It expands, gets, expands, and then finds the target um, target image. And so this is what it looks like, you know, visually as the agent moves around. Um, and it, you can also build a local map just to visualize, but uh, this is the global based representation. And this is sort of another example where, you know, the agent expands and essentially finds the goal, right? Um, so different ways, again, of, of representing the environment. And what we find is, again, if we look at the end-to-end -end type of learning systems, they don't do very well. If we compare modular metric maps versus topological maps, for this particular setting, we, we're doing better. Um, so we're finding that these sort of uh, neural topological uh, maps and neural topological search, what we call, is much better. Um, uh, that captures some form of semantic files, explicit semantic files. 
uh, right? And so this actually helped us improve and it, it also we found it to be more robust to the noise. But again, this is just an alternative view and it's telling us something about, you know, these two different approaches to, um, uh, uh, to this problem. It's effectively how do we re represent our underlying uh, uh, map? So there's still room for, uh, for improvement as well as room for doing uh, more research. Now, the next thing that I wanted to sort of mention is that, okay, well, we've looked at these systems, we've looked at these approaches. approaches. One of the challenges for us right now is when we look at, you know, these types of navigation tasks, is one of the biggest tasks, one of the biggest problems is when we build a semantic map, our inability to, you know, to um, build accurate semantic maps. Um, right? Because it requires to have a good perception model. It requires us to uh, build good object detection systems. Um, ultimately, we want to figure out where the tables are, where the chairs are, and so forth in these environments. And a lot of times we actually, you know, not succeeding. Uh, and the reason why we're not succeeding, uh, we're just, uh, we're not succeeding is that you know, we're looking at, you know, state-of-the-art um, perception models like MASK RCNN. And what happens in, you know, in these environments is that a lot of existing state-of-the-art pre-trained perception models are built of uh, static internet data, right? So people collecting data like this, and you do semantic segmentation, you do detection and, and, and so forth. Whereas in active embodied environment, when the engine actually moves in the environment, the data looks like this, um, right? So you can sort of see, first of all, persistency through time. And sometimes you also see, you know, you have views from weird viewpoints, uh, right? So for example, there's like big doors over here. So, you know, you, very rarely you'd see an example where somebody would take a picture like this and then they would go and label like a chair here, a sofa here, right? just because the image itself is just not very good image. Uh, but those are the images that we actually get to see when your agent actually moves around the environment. So the distribution of um, the data and the kind of patterns that we see from static internet data when we train these systems versus active embodied data is very different, right? And we do see these examples where, you know, the agent moves around and this is a false positive. We try to find a chair and the model says, this is a chair. Um, uh, or this is an example of a false uh, negative where we basically trying to look at, for the toilet and the toilet is over here, um, but we don't see it because it's, you know, half, you know, it's heavily occluded, um, right? So this is a particular example where we, you know, where we, we're trying to find the target and we're just failing to find the target because our, our you know, um, perception model fails. Um, right, and so when we think about active embodied data, we typically think about, let's say you have an image like this, you can say, well, these are the chairs or these are the couches. And as we go through time, you know, if you think about static objects in the environment, static objects in the environment, they persist, they persist through time, uh, right? They're not gonna be disappearing in your environment. So, you know, if, if you see sort of dynamic objects that yes, they can change, but a lot of static objects don't change, right? It's not like for this particular, you know, uh, frame, uh, this couch is gonna disappear, um, right? So, and there's been a few papers, actually a number of papers trying to, you know, uh, um, do video understanding or video analysis instead of using these ideas of object persistency through time, just because objects don't tend to appear or disappear, you know, from one frame to the next. And we're going to make use of the same idea in, in, in this setting as well, right? Um, but the way that we're going to do it is we're going to uh, look at closing perception actually. Um, and this is one, I believe, is one of, um, you know, it's probably going to, we're going to see a lot more uh, um, um, research done in that space where the idea is that, you know, let's say the first step, you're going to be using what we call self-supervised active exploration. So think about the agent just exploring the environment with no supervision at all, uh, right? Um, and now once you explore the environment, you can do what we call self-supervised visual learning. 
So it's this sort of the idea that by exploring the environment, I can learn more about the environment. And in fact, what I can do is I can improve my own perception system simply by exploring the environment, right? And again, these ideas have been around for, for a long time. There's, you know, I'm listing a few papers that are trying to do that, but I think it's a very powerful um, thinking going forward, which is in the embodied space, um, uh, you can do a lot of things that you can do, you know, by just passively observing uh, uh, um, uh, your data, right? So here you essentially can take actions, explore the environment and learn about the uh, uh, environment and in fact, learn about uh, uh, new objects in the environment or improve your own perception system. Um, and so this is sort of the, the, the setting where let's say you buy a robot and, you know, you put your robot in your house and you let it go. And your robot just moves around the house, does what it's doing. You don't care what it's doing. And then a few days later, it just has a much better perception. It has, has much better visual recognition system. Um, and it knows a lot more about your environment, right? That's, that's the goal without using any sort of uh, uh, labels, uh, hum, human annotations. So let's look at the first phase. So the first phase for us is going to be to trying to learn active exploration policy. And the idea here is that, you know, given observations, as the agent observes the environment, we're going to take state-of-the-art perception model. In this case, we're using Mascar CNN, and we're going to build the 3D map of the world. And we're going to be using what we call exploration policy to efficiently explore this environment and build a 3D semantic map. Now, why is this useful? Well, it's going to be useful uh, in the sense that we can now take these trajectories, these sam sample trajectories, we can look at our 3D semantic map and uh, we can use what we call 3D label propagation to essentially create new pseudo labels uh, based on our sample trajectories. And the high level idea behind this approach is super simple. It's essentially saying that if I'm looking at my laptop and I know this is my laptop, but if I look at my laptop from a different viewpoint, and because it's partially occluded or because it's just a very non, you know, unusual viewpoint, my perception system might say, I don't know what this is because I've never seen laptops from this viewpoint. But because I know this is you know, the laptop because it hasn't moved, um, I can actually generate a pseudo label or I can generate the correct label for my laptop and improve my perception system. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing here. So let me go into details and show you what these two phases are. And importantly, both phases do not require any additional label data, uh, right? So this is done in, in, in completely unsupervised or self-supervised way. So how do we build a 3D semantic mapping? Just very quickly, you know, given RGB, and in this case, we have a depth. Um, we can also estimate the depth, but let's say we have a depth. Um, we have semantic predictions coming from, you know, our internet-based pre-trained model. We have point clouds, so we can create the semantic scores. So now we have a representation of, you know, egocentric point cloud, just, just combining depth and the semantic predictions. And then we're essentially doing the transformation, the spatial transformation to get, you know, our points into geodesic uh, space. And we have a representation of the voxelized space. And then we do map ag aggregation. This is very similar to what I've shown you before. Uh, right, so it's, you know, if you have these pieces, there's a little bit of, you know, learning that, that, that's happening here, but, um, uh, and you can certainly improve uh, that part of the system by, probably by a lot, but the basic way that we're doing it is essentially uh, a simple, um, a simple mapping, right? And now as the agent explores the environment, it builds this uh, semantic uh, 3D map. Um, so it's a voxelized based representation, right? And the map is represented by, you know, length, width, height, as well as K. K is the number of channels and the number of objects. So here we're looking at six objects, um, right? Um, of course, you can extend it to more objects and uh, more scenes and more environments. So the entire system can be scaled. It just requires more compute. But this is what the semantic map looks like. Now, the question is, you have a policy you know, because you have to take actions to move around in this environment. The question is what type of policy you should be learning so that you can explore this, uh, um, you can build as good of a semantic map as possible. 
right? So that you explore the space and build the semantic map. So we do something very simple. We say, well, um, this is what we get based on, you know, perception model, our existing perception model. What we're gonna do is we're gonna count the number of voxels with high confidence. Right? So we're summing across high uh, breadth and, and, and uh, length. And we'll look at the voxels with the highest uh, confidence. And this now becomes our reward. So the reward for um, 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 trying to basically you know, maximize uh, getting definitive knowledge. So the idea here is that if your agent tries to look and tries to look at the, you know, explore viewpoints where you confidently can say, yes, this is a chair, this is a table, and you collect as much information as possible, then you get high reward. Otherwise, you don't. So it's a fairly simple objective, and it actually works reasonably well, right, when we, when we uh, uh, build these policies. And so this, the entire pipeline looks like this. You know, you have observations, you have sensor posts, you do 3D semantic mapping. You have a global policy that's telling you where you need to go, followed by deterministic policy. So it's very much the same um, you know, ideas, what, what, what I've shown you in the active neural slide. It's just a little, uh, here we do 3D semantic mapping as opposed to 2D semantic mapping, right? And the action space for us is, you know, fairly simple as well. Now, in the second phase, what we do, how do we do 3D label propagation is the following. Let's say the agent at a particular location, the agent has the pose. Um, and what we can do is we can essentially do instance level segmentation by doing ray tracing. So we're essentially projecting this 3D semantic map onto the 2D uh, image. And what's interesting here is that if we take this image and we run state-of-the-art mask RCNN model, it's actually missing two things. It's making, you know, it's not predicting this as a chair, and we know there is a chair, and it's not predicting this as a, <coughs> I think as a table. <coughs> or, or is another object, right? And so essentially now we can fine tune our system to say, you know what, this is a chair. So predict this as a chair. Um, and this is exactly what happens as the agent moves around through the environment. And, um, and this is another example of um, a false positive. <coughs> Sorry. And so because we, we have the estimation of our 3D semantic map, it's easy enough for us to figure out where our perception model is failing, right? And what we can do is we can actually update our model or retrain our model. And notice that again, just by using this consistency of labels, because we know that these objects are static and by looking at them from different viewpoints, we can essentially create more, more labels uh, to train them. Um, and so now we can look at generalization, for example, we can look at specialization. So specialization is a, is a setting where I throw you in a new environment and you get to explore this environment for a fixed number of time steps. And by exploring this new environment for a fixed number of time steps, hopefully you will improve your perception system, um, right? And so this is just um, the data set. We'll look at the Gibson data set. There's 25 training examples, five test scenes. You have six object categories. And, you know, there's a regular split. We're reporting, you know, bounding box and mass AP 50 score. So, you know, just so that we can compare it to a lot of uh, 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 existing work. And what's interesting about these systems is that on a generalization task where they, we just throw you in a completely new environment, if you just take existing perception system, you sort of get these numbers. And you see there's been a lot of work kind of, you know, trying to improve these numbers. And you can see a lot of these numbers basically remain the same, right? You can use self-training, you can use optical flow. There's different ways of kind of combining things. Whereas if you're doing this self-supervised 3D label propagation, you can improve numbers by quite a bit. What's also interesting is that, you know, these numbers go up if you allow your system to explore the new environment a little bit, um, right? And so at least it's the first iteration we kind of like saw substantial gains in performance by moving around the environment and learning about the environment. And now we're at the stage where we try to scale it up to 
I think, hundred scenes and also looking on the order of like multiple thousands of examples, because I think the scalability of, by scaling these systems up, we can actually probably do much, much better. Okay, and this sort of gives us a notion of, you know, this notion of uh, a, a perception action uh, in a setting. And so we've also applied these types of algorithms to actually doing semantic mapping, right? And this is an example where we're not just finding where the free space is, but we're also finding, you know, um, uh, where different objects are and, and, and what they represent. And just by doing, you know, the semantic exploration, again, the numbers improve uh, 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 reasonably well compared to just using semantic exploration. So if we put the seal environment on top of it, we can do much, much better. So by learning about the environment and exploring the environment, the numbers increase by, you know, by quite a bit compared to not doing that. Now, in the last five minutes, and I'm almost done, I wanted to also show you the setting of, you know, combining all of these ideas, but with applications to instruction following. So there is this task called Alfred task, where I give you an instruction, you know, let's say an instruction says, place a cold lettuce slice in a waste basket. Given this instruction, you have to come up with a set of sub goals. So here the sub goals are, and given this set of sub goals, you have to execute these, uh, uh, these sub goals to, to, uh, you know, to successfully complete the task. All right. And if you look at the overall system, again, it's fairly similar to what I've mentioned before, but now we have the language parsing um, uh, module. You can think of the language parsing module essentially analyzing what the instruction is and identifying what the subtasks are. So these types of systems are interesting because you have language, you have images, so you have to do some form of semantic mapping, depth estimation, you have a language, you have to create the sub goals. And then we have something that we call the semantic search policy that takes this information and tries to figure out how to solve the next, uh, um, the next goal uh, or how to solve the next uh, uh, sub goal. And just to show you visually what that looks like, right? As the agent moves around, um, it sort of completes, you know, the first task moves around, completes the second task, and it's actually fairly challenging uh, um, uh, uh, setting. So if you look at the black box the enforcement learning algorithms, I think the success rate is about 6%. Um, if you look at state of the art system, at the time when, uh, when we were publishing this paper, we were um, getting a success rate of about 25%, you know, completing all of the tasks. Tasks and human success rates are close to 90%. So it's an interesting, challenging problem. One interesting point here, for example, is that if you look at the instruction, which is kind of funny, the instruction says, uh, you know, place lettuce in a wastebasket. But if you look at the sub goals, one of the sub goals is to open the fridge, put the lettuce in the fridge, close the fridge, then open the fridge, pick up a lettuce, and then throw it in the, in, you know, throw it in the garbage bin. Um, so it's interesting, like, why do you need to execute these instructions? And the reason why you need to do that is because the instruction says, place a cold lettuce. So the lettuce has to be cold. And in order to make it cold, you have to put it in the fridge, right? So there's sort of like some of these kind of like a low level semantics um, uh, things that you need to understand. Because if you fail to put the lettuce in the, in, in, in the fridge, then you will basically fail. Um, right, and, and again, just to show you, there's been a, uh, multiple, you know, uh, approaches and um, just trying to solve these tasks. And, you know, this is kind of like our approach um, to solving it. And again, I think the key component within these tasks is this notion of building a semantic map, trying to understand where objects are and what the relationship between these objects so you can complete all of these different uh, subtasks. And finally, just to mention, you know, how do you solve simulation to real? Many of you know about, you know, these problems. There is visual domain gap. There is a physical domain gap. Visual things look different. Physically, you have to do a better, you know, how do you, you know, map what you have in a simulation to actually taking actions in the real world. So that's fairly challenging. And, you know, this is something that we've been playing with a little bit and using the Pi robot and, you know, the robot that Facebook gave us. Uh, but what's surprising is that a lot of these systems, these modular systems um, that we've built in the simulation, <clears throat> I actually, you know, get to, we, we transfer them to the real world fairly easily. 
um, you know, part of it may be that the tasks that we're solving are, are easier tasks, just navigation tasks, but we haven't hit any sort of walls when we're doing transfer from simulation to real. And ultimately, you know, what is it that we want to do? Well, we want to build AI agents, right? We want to build agents that can move around autonomously, that can localize plan, that can look at the multimodal input. So you have to understand the natural language instruction. You have to understand the visual representation that you're getting. Um, that can perceive human speech, you know, reason and understand natural language. So all of these pieces. And I feel like in this sort of embodied AI setting is, is, is a natural way of testing a lot of these environments, a lot of these ideas, as opposed to, you know, traditional way of, of, you know, either looking at passively at the videos or looking passively at the images and, um, you know, learning based on that. So I'll stop here and I want to thank a lot of my students who worked on different aspects of, you know, uh, uh, of, of, of these environments. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, they can just unmute themselves to ask. Yeah, absolutely. I know that you guys have social at like uh, five or something, right? So I wanted to make sure that I- uh, uh, It's actually at 515. So we have, this, uh, we have a couple minutes to ask if anyone has a, like their questions. And, and I should point out like what people asking questions is that code for pretty much all of these models um, is online. So if you're interested in playing with them, um, you can. So I'll ask a question. Hi, Russ. Hi, Leslie, how are you? Good, how are you? So this is what we're trying to do. I, I mean, I love it, right? Um, I'm curious though, I always worry about, I mean, I'm into the modular thing in a way, but I always worry about the connectivity of things, right? So if you train this or build that or train this other thing and build this other thing, then there remains this issue of like, making sure the plugs are compatible. How do you think about that in a bigger scale? Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a hard, um, uh, that's, a, that's a tough question, uh, Leslie. So I, I agree. So, you know, how do you put different plugs together is a difficult problem. So for example, for us right now, um, we are, we basically able to reuse anything that has to do with visual or language tasks, subtasks. So for example, you know, in the setting where I showed examples of instruction following, we essentially took the semantic map building piece from the habitat from other environments and just plugged that in. Uh, for the language part, it's the same story. We take, you know, BERT-like or, you know, large scale language models and we plug that in. Um, uh, but now, you know, once, but then the question is like, how do you solve specific subtasks? And this is where we kind of like need to do a little bit more engineering to glue things together. So I do feel like, you know, on the representation learning side, there are ways of mm -hmm. reusability. And I think like, so for example, depth estimation, it becomes such a hard, uh, I mean, it's such an important piece for instruction following because if your depth is wrong, then, then you fail a lot. It was like one of the biggest failure points for us. But we've reused the depth estimator from somebody else who built that for your habitat right. simulator, right? So I think that on these pieces on the presentation learning side, we, we're at the stages where there, there is a reusability. I think that on policy learning side, and this is where we, we don't, we basically have to either run it in the simulators and yeah, so this is where I, I don't know how to, um, you know, what's the best way looking going forward. I think that now that now that there is a larger community of people interested in these environments, I think there's going to be more and more settings where instead of just looking at one specific task, if you have 20 different tasks that you're trying to solve, then I think we'll be forced to figure out what are the right pieces we need to put together. Um, to make sure that we can actually solve all of these tasks jointly. Um, right. So I think that that's the only way for us to, because I think, you know, the problem also right now is that, you know, we do also chase after numbers 
And by chasing after numbers, we do make something very specific to uh, a specific task, a specific environment we're working with. Um, but cool, thank you. Anybody else? So I have a quick question. Uh, so about re with respect to the multimodal inputs, uh, like, do you think there are other types of like modalities or that it or would be useful? So, I mean, so for these types of things, um, right? Like, you know, there's language, there's vision. I mean, obviously if you talk to people who work on self-driving cars, uh, we had a lot of conversations with them where they would say, you know, can you use LIDAR as a way of kind of like estimating the depth, obviously. Can you use um, uh, range sensors? Um, and obviously you can. Um, um, I think that, you know, obviously, I mean, with other modalities, you can improve things. Like we have LIDAR, we have, you know, other types of sensors. Um, you can probably improve the semantic map building piece. Um, I think that <clears throat> with instruction, kind of like executing an instruction, there's a language piece. And this is now becoming interesting because you have to find, like we have this called, something called semantic search policy. I haven't talked about this, but <clears throat> we, for example, we do find things like understanding small objects versus large objects. Mm -hmm. So when we, when, we, when we walk in a scene like this, finding countertops and refrigerators is easy because these are big objects. But finding a knife is really difficult because if I have no knowledge about, you know, it's just a knife, it's just another object that I'm looking for, it basically becomes very difficult to find it. So what we're using here is we're using sort of the estimation of saying, well, Knives are typically on the countertops, right? So if I see countertops and I need to slice something, I would go and start walking around the countertops and look at the countertops because that's the only way for me to find the knife. Um, so these sort of semantic search priors is where the language and the vision come together. And it's interesting because when we worked on this problem at the very beginning, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't beat sort of black box, silly end-to-end -end RL systems. That would basically say, here's a gigantic LSTM, just feed everything in and, and produce the action. Um, uh, and so we were able to improve substantially once we started kind of like understanding relationship between objects, uh, right? You know, you, you know somebody's still selling you a slice of lettuce. Where's the lettuce? Well, lettuce is typically in the fridge or on the countertops, um, right? It's not on the floor. Like if we're looking for something else, something might be on the floor. So, so there is this, in, 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 you know, part of it, you could argue that if you had a perfect perception system, then you can perfectly find a small knife and a fork anywhere in the room. But because we don't have perfect perception system, we have to kind of like find these small objects. And that's actually forced us to understand the semantics of, you know, co-occurrence of objects in this environment. So I think this is where, you know, the multimodality really plays a role because it's visual and language, at least in this setting. Uh, and I'm sure you can do something much better. You can build probably better semantic search policies where you can build some, you know, something like a first order logic where you can say, well, knives are typically on top of the countertops or the top of the tables. And you, know, you, can, you can probably build something that's much more rich uh, than what we've done. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. It seems like maybe there aren't uh, any other questions. But thank you again for giving such a great talk. Uh, yeah. 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 If you have any questions, feel free. You know, if you if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Or you know, I've talked to many some of the students, but feel free to email me if you have questions about the talk. Or if you're interested in the code, I think that for pretty much all of these papers and all of these models, we have released the code. And so you should be able to, you know, if you're working in that space, if you're interested, you should be able to, you know, take the code, reuse it and, and you know, um, 
basically reproduce the results in, in, in all of these papers. So thank you.